Revelation chapter 12. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 12. Let's read from verse 8 to verse 12. And this is our text for today, and we'll be flowing in and out of it. Well, let's pick it up in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Did it say he will be cast out? The great dragon was cast out. Is it done? Is it finished? The great dragon was cast out. And that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Which deceived the whole world. He was cast out. Say he was cast out. Now the dragon. Who is also called the serpent. The devil and Satan. There, those are some of his names. But the one thing that is common in each of those names that they, they, they describe various aspects or, 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 or of his, and his characteristics, what is common is he deceiveth. He is a deceiver. Amen? And the Bible says he would deceive even the very elect, which is the very people of God. If you allow him through ignorance, or simply by not walking in your authority, he can even come and sit as the head of the congregation behind pulpits and use the voice of, of preachers to accomplish his deception. But the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. There is an anointing that exposes the lies and the deception of the enemy. Amen? And that anointing abides in me. That anointing abides in you. And I yield to that anointing by the power of the Holy Ghost by faith. So as to destroy the lies and the deception of the enemy. Sometimes in the tearing down of those lies and the deceptions, people sometimes have some pets and they figure that, you, you know, they don't want you to come in a certain area. Because when you begin to, to, to chip away those lies and you begin to chop down those trees, folks get offended because they want to hold on to it. But know this, the truth is always far more powerful and profitable than the lie. So don't hold on to the lie. Be willing and be glad to let go of it. Amen? You don't want deception. Paul said that the Spirit of God, that when God called him, God sent him and God says, here is your assignment, Paul, Acts 26 and verse 18. He says, your, uh, your, your assignment, he says, first of all, I've set you free from the Gentiles to whom I send you. In other words, I've set you free from the people. I've brought you into a place where you are dead to them and they do not affect you. You can have love and compassion for them, but you are not to be intimidated or be moved by their faces. So first of all, God says, I've delivered you from the, from the people to whom I now send you. And I'm sending you, and here is your assignment. Get for their eyes, for you to open up their eyes. For the eyes of their understanding to be opened. And for them to be delivered from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to the power of God. And for them to, 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 to receive their forgiveness and to receive the inheritance that belongs to them that they are able to receive by faith. Amen? You do, your faith don't get you the inheritance. The inheritance is yours because of the sacrifice of Christ. Your faith helps you to receive it. Are you with me? Sometimes we are busy trying to use our faith to do what Jesus has already done. Sometimes we are busy trying to use our faith to try to get God to do what he's already done. That's a waste of energy. If he has done it, all you need to do is find out about it and receive it. Your faith is for receiving. Amen? 
But there is a need for the eyes to be open so that we could be where God wants us to be, not underneath the rule of the enemy, but rather underneath the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But the enemy is there to deceive. He wants to deceive. So this great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called, called, called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud, no, what we just read is the truth. It is done. It is finished. It is so. It is over. He's already been cast out, he and all of his angels. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Did it say now is going to come? Is that what it says? It, did it say salvation is, is coming? Strength is coming? The kingdom of God shall show up? The power of it? No, it says it is come. It is here. The kingdom of God is here. The salvation is here. Strength is here. The power of his Christ is here. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. The third time it mentions this phrase, cast down. That the enemy is cast down. Now when Jesus says verily, verily, normally that means I want to make sure you take notice of this. I, in other words, I want to emphasize this. Jesus should not have to say verily. Once Jesus says it, it is so. And we ought to so highly esteem and honor his word that he only ought to say it once. But he understands the frailty and, our, and our, the weaknesses that we yield to from our humanity. So many times he would say verily, verily. Amen? But here he's not just saying verily, verily. He's saying it three times that the enemy has been cast down. So it must be that God wants you, God wants to make sure that you get it, that you and I get it. The enemy is cast down. Say he is cast down. You see, many times as believers, we fall into this place where we are trying to get the enemy underneath our feet. We are trying to put him underneath our feet. We are trying to. And you don't have to try to put the enemy underneath your feet. He is already underneath your feet. And that is an awakening that we must come to. That's a consciousness that must permeate our thinking. That must be a place where we live and function from. You see, many times people try, your faith functions from a position. Your faith functions from where you are in Christ. Your faith is not for you to get what you have in Christ. Why would you want to get what you already have? That don't make sense. Are you with me? You need to find out what you have, acknowledge it, receive it, but your faith is not to get what you have. Your faith is to function from where you are. You see, the Bible says that you and I, in Ephesians 1 verse 3, are blessed with what? Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Does it say that? We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, every means every. But many times what happens is, we have slipped into a mindset. It's a worldly mindset that we try to adapt into Christianity. Try to use spiritual weapons to get what we were hoping to get from the world. So now, we try to use our faith to get stuff. God says you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. And we try to use our faith to get the spiritual blessings that we already have. No, in other words, as if our faith is to help us to get to that place. To get to being blessed with every spiritual blessing. Faith is not for you to get to, get to the, the spiritual blessing. Faith is for you to operate from the place that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. There is a difference. Amen? So let me just sow that seed and, uh, and it's going to come up some more today and, and in the weeks to come. That your faith has to function from the position that you are in Christ. In fact, let me put it this way, the way Peter put it. Peter put it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, this is just very quickly, so you don't need to turn to it. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter uses this phrase. He says, through the, it says, um, 
we have obtained like precious faith that you have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. Righteousness is the foundation of your faith. If you try to operate in faith and you have a sense of separation between you and God, your faith is not going to work. Amen? If your faith is coming from a sin consciousness, it's not going to work. Righteousness, this oneness that you have with God in Christ, is where your faith is the foundation of your faith. Amen? You, your faith has to operate from where you are in Christ. And that's the place of righteousness. That is the place where you're blessed with every spiritual blessing. That is the place where God sees you holy, blameless, without fault, without reproach. Amen? That's where your faith needs to operate from. So many, so if you honor need a yoke of condemnation, your faith is not going to work. Because that's not, where you, that's not where you are in Christ. In him, there is no condemnation. Isn't that right? Are you with me? All right. So getting back to um, Revelation chapter 11. So he says, um, I heard a lot of voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. They overcame him. Again, he is not saying that you will overcome. He's not talking about the future. He's talking about what is already done. Amen? You are male, you are female by birth. Well, you are an overcomer by the new birth. You are born over an overcomer. Amen? It says in 1 John chapter 5, Whosoever is born of God overcometh. Is it because of his works? Is it because of his, uh, uh, how deeply spiritual he was? Is it because he was abounding and flowing and walking and, and manifesting the love of God? No. Once you are born again, you are an overcomer. Amen. In all of this, there's a shift that I'm, there, there's something I'm trying to, uh, 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 by the power and anointing of God to get through to your spirit and then it will float up in your mind which is, the, is to get to the place where you can recognize that there's certain that what God said is done we like to think as if what God said is what he's going to do what God said he has already done when it comes to your healing it is done what, once God said it it is done and we have to make that shift and to recognize it is done, it is finished. When you recognize it's done and it is finished, then you, then you don't have to fight to try to get God to do what he's already done. Amen? So this is, so even as I'm talking about this or about that or about the order which I will for a while, it is to get this across to you. It is done. Say it is done. Jesus said it is finished. You know what that means? It's finished. It means it's done. When Jesus says it's finished, it is done. He's saying it's over. We don't have to go through that again. It is over. Say it's over. Now that needs to get through to your consciousness. This is a consciousness. This is a way of thinking, a way you must be. Because it is the way you are in Christ. So the enemy is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice. Because all of that is true. The enemy is cast down. Salvation has come. Strength has come. The kingdom of Christ has come. The kingdom of God has come. His power and his anointing is here. The accuser has been silenced. He, you have overcome him by the blood, by the word. It's no longer you, but it's Christ that living in you. You love not your life even unto death. Because those things are true, rejoice. Say rejoice. So if you are not rejoicing, it means the truth of those things have not yet penetrated. Are you with me? 
If you know for sure, I mean, can you imagine you've got some bills, you've got some financial challenges, but you know beyond a shadow of a doubt there has been a deposit of several thousands or millions of dollars in your account and you've got access to it. And you know that and you believe that and you have that confidence. How easy is it to rejoice? But that rejoicing comes from a knowing. And if you can't rejoice over it, it's because you probably don't believe it. So if you can't do this, it says, therefore rejoice. My point is, if you're not rejoicing, could it be that the consciousness of the enemy is under my feet. He is now my footstool. He has been cast down. I have overcome him by the blood, by the word. It's, not only, it's no longer I that live. And the salvation, the anointing, the power, the kingdom of God is here. It's real. It's done. It's finished. It's over. It's not real to me. Come on, you got to be honest to yourself. Because if it's not real to you, then it means you got some work to do. Amen? And if you got some work to do, then you might as well get started. How about today? How about now? Amen? Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Ye that dwell in them. This, the Bible says that we were raised up together with Christ. And we were made to sit together with him in where? Heavenly places. Then the Bible says that God said to Jesus, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And does not the Bible says they that overcome are seated with him. Doesn't the Bible says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Doesn't it say our conversation is in heaven? Are you seated in heavenly places? Come on, you have got to decide you believe this word. You have got to decide that this word is more true than anything you can see on the horizontal. Amen? One of the reasons for the sacrifice of Christ was to liberate you and set you free from being bound by your reasoning and logic and senses. In other words, if I can see it in the natural, I can't believe it. You need to be delivered from that. And Jesus died for that purpose. Amen? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. That means you have to rejoice. Amen. That is where you are. You are in him and you are seated in heavenly places. Now you need to awake to that and dwell in that. And recognize that that is so. But what if you don't? What if you don't recognize that the enemy is underneath your feet. That he has been cast down. What if you don't recognize that salvation, deliverance, wholeness is here and it's yours? What if you do not recognize that the Lord is the strength of my life? What if you do not awake to the reality that the blood speaks and the blood has declared a perfect, thorough, complete, absolute redemption? Suppose that don't mean nothing to you. What if you, have not, you don't have the testimony that is in agreement with the truth? You know what I say? And the enemy, and you don't even have the awareness. Now, I'm not trying to put you down, but I am being sharp. I'm telling you the truth, and I'm not pulling punches. I'm not in a pull-punch mood today. Amen? All right. Now, if that's not you, all right? And you are not taking up that dwelling place in heaven. And you are here. And you are living like an earthling. And the enemy has been cast out. Watch this. Next verse. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the sea. Because the devil has come down unto you. Having great wrath. Because he knew it. That he had but a short time. Woe. If you don't have this mindset and this comprehension, 
and you are not able to receive and recognize that the strength is here, the glory is here, the anointing is here, the power of Christ is here, the kingdom of God is within us. I have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony and the enemy is cast down. If you don't have that awareness and you are not able to rejoice, then you are not in the rejoicing bunch, but you are going to be in the bunch of the woe. Woe, because the enemy is now there among you and he's angry. And he's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So really, it's about which group you want to live in. You want to live in the rejoicing bunch? The rejoicing <laughs> group? <laughs> or you want to live in the war group? Now you might think the war group is just for the people of the world. That's not true. They are believers. By the millions that are living in the war group. You know why? Because they don't know the enemy is cast down. They don't know their authority. They don't know salvation has come. And they are being robbed day and night. And the enemy is there like a roaring lion. Stealing, killing, destroying, bringing offense, bringing guilt. Co contaminating them with his own, with his own guilt and, and insecurity and fears and, and resentment and, and bitterness. And hurt. Are you with me? It's not supposed to be that way. Jesus has died to liberate us. Now let me show you something. If we were to break this down, you'll find about eight things here. you find there is salvation that has come. You will find there is strength. There is the power of the kingdom. There is the kingdom of God. There is the power of Christ. There is the enemy cast down. There is, there is the power of the blood. There is the word of your testimony. And there is the love, not your life, even unto death. There are eight, eight things in this verse that it says we need to awake to and have a consciousness of. And every one of these eight things. Now listen to this. Every one of these eight things are as a result of what Jesus did. And, it is, and every one of these things is so irregardless of what you do or don't do. You had zero to do with any of it. Zero. Zilch. All of it is because of the sacrifice of Christ. The kingdom of God is here because of his sacrifice. The power of, the, of Christ is here because of his sacrifice. Strength is here because of his sacrifice. Salvation is here because of his sacrifice. The devil has been cast down because of his sacrifice. The blood that declares victory is because of his sacrifice. The word is because of his sacrifice. And I'll tell you something. You might think you have something to do with the loving your life, for love not your life, even unto death. Even that you don't have anything to do with. That too is because of his sacrifice. The reality of the fact that you love not your life, even unto death, and it's, it's the fact that you are crucified with him, and it is no longer you that live, but it is Christ that liveth in you. Now, you may not live that way. You may not embrace that. that may not, you may not be awake to that. But every single believer, regardless of whether he knows it or not, the truth is he was baptized into Jesus' death. And like as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, he also was raised up. Every believer, whether he's just born again two minutes ago, no matter what denomination he's in, no matter what he knows or don't know, every believer was in Christ and was crucified with him. And it is no longer them that live, but it is Christ that liveth in them. And every believer, the life that they now live, it is the life of Christ that is in them. Are you with me? This issue of the identification on who you are in him is not because of anything you did. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But it's according to his mercy that we were washed and regenerated and renewed and have this new birth. And our, the new, we are now his workmanship. Are you with me? What am I saying? 
What I'm saying is every bit of this that makes the difference as to whether you live in the rejoicing group or the war group is based on the sacrifice of Christ. What does that say to you and I? It means then that if we do not awake and have and, and don't make the sacrifice of Christ our constant meditation where it takes over our thinking and we live in it and as a result of it, then we will just automatically fall into the war group. It means that you and I must make this a priority. Amen? And for God, it's a priority. In fact, the sacrifice, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hello? Hebrews chapter 10. Halakabo seek in the Mongolia. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the sacrifice of Christ is the truth. Amen. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hmm. The sacrifice of Christ is so phenomenal and so outstanding. Now, somewhere over the next several weeks, and possibly even months. We're going to walk through the book of Hebrews. Amen. So that we could come into a place of confidence. That God wants us to have. A confidence that comes out. Of the realization. Of who Jesus is. And who we are in him. And what his sacrifice has accomplished. Because the Bible says that when we come, there's a confidence that if we get a hold of it and we don't cast it away, and we become rooted and grounded and settled, anchored in it, there is a confidence that you and I can come into. And when we get there, the rule of the enemy in our lives or over our lives would be history. Amen? Him manipulating us through our flesh, through our lust, through our history, through our, uh, 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 I, I mean, what, what other people think and don't, all of that stuff will come to an end. And I know it's my responsibility to minister the word, just like Paul said, to not only bring you to the place where your eyes are open, but also for you to come to the place where you're not underneath the power of the enemy. Where you're not underneath the yoke and the bondage of darkness. But where you can be living in the liberty of the sons of God. And the liberty of the light and the truth. Amen? It is about truth. Let me back up a bit. Let me, let, me, let me back up a bit and say some things. Here are some facts. The fact is the devil has been defeated through the sacrifice of Christ. He has been defeated. But even though he's been defeated, he is on earth. He's been cast up, but he is on earth. And he wants to steal, kill, destroy, op op um, oppress, possess, um, inflict, cause you to become offended, frustrated, disappointed. Have you ever experienced any of those things? It's not coming from God. Bitter for you to be, for you to be, uh, become judgmental and, 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 and angry and, and for you to be fearful and unbelieving. That's what he wants to do. But God has given you and I weapons so that you and I can absolutely prevail against the enemy. And that you and I may be able to walk in liberty. 
the weapon, they are weapons, but the weapon that the Lord has given to you and I is truth. Say truth. Now, it's hard to define truth. I don't know that you can define truth. The weapon is truth. It is truth in that it is the knowledge of who Christ is, and I'm going to repeat this over and over and over for you to get it. Because it's what the New Testament is all about. Thank God for the stories of the New Testament. I love stories because they illustrate. Amen? And it's nice all the promises and this and that and all the revelations. But at the end of the day, what the New Testament is, and especially the epistles is about, is three things. One, that you might know who Christ is. Two, that you might know what his sacrifice has accomplished. Three, that you might know who you are in him. That's what it's about. So the weapon is true. The weapon is the knowledge of who Christ is, what his sacrifice has accomplished, and who you are in him. That's the weapon that you have against the enemy. And once you know, I'm going to give you another tree here. Oh, well, yeah. Once you get a hold of the truth, then there is the application of the truth. The Bible says the application of the truth produces what? Freedom, liberty. When you correctly apply the truth, victory is assured. It is guaranteed. And that victory that you get, quote, because of the application of truth is called your testimony. Say testimony. Remember how it says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? Your testimony is a successful application of truth. Amen? All right. Your testimony is your, uh, and, and I don't know if we're going to get time to go here today, but in Titus 1 verse 2, it speaks, it uses the phrase, the acknowledgement of the truth. That literally will cause the manifestation of the life of God, which is the life of Jesus to come forth. I'm, I'm talking about in, the, in this realm, in the horizontal. Your testimony, that acknowledgement of the truth, that agreement with the truth, that, that there is your weapon. But now hear this now. Your testimony, which is the acknowledgement of the truth, and as a result, here comes my victory. That victory, that testimony, now becomes the weapon of liberation for others. Your family, your friends, your co-workers, whoever you meet. For them to have victory, don't forget, they are underneath. If they don't know Christ, and even if they do know Christ. If they do know, they could know Christ and, and be born again and still be in the world group. Why? Because they don't understand truth. They haven't gotten a hold of truth. They don't recognize they have overcome. They don't recognize the enemy has been cast down. They don't recognize the power and anointing and the kingdom of God that is within them that rules by the, and is activated by righteousness. They don't know those things. Amen? So this could apply to a believer. But whoever it is that is underneath the bondage of the enemy, whether it be another believer, whether it be a brother, a sister, a niece, a nephew, a spouse, or whoever, for them to have liberty, God did not just save you for you. You are God's inheritance. You are God's reward for offering up his son. You are what God has been paid back. Are you with me? You are his treasure. And so God has gotten a hold of you. He wants you to have this liberty and this freedom by getting a hold of truth and applying it. But, but as you do, he wants you to now take that truth that you have applied, that testimony that you now have, and he wants that testimony to come and bring liberty to somebody else. And by so doing, the life that he has placed in you, that it will be multiplied. God is a businessman, and he is the best. He's got a lot of property. Amen? Lots of property. Donald Trump can't touch him. 
<laughs> and as a good businessman, God knows that when he makes an investment, he wants a hundredfold return. He wants a big return. He doesn't expect to make an investment and get that investment back. He expects to get that investment multiplied. So God has placed his son in you. God wants you to get a hold of the truth concerning this life in you. And then he wants that life that is in you for you to go and multiply it. By what? Having it reproduced in others. So you become his battle axe and his weapon that he can use to, to rescue other people. And that he can use to set other people free. That he can use to make the enemy be in that place where he belongs. It's, uh, uh, God wants to use you against the enemy and against his angels. Amen. Say I'm God's battle axe. You see the reason why it is so important. Why God would say one person saved in a family sanctifies the whole family. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4. One person, an unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband and vice versa. And I believe it goes further. One child in that home sets that whole home apart and makes that home a target. Every individual put, God, put them on God's radar. Why? Why is it so? Because. Once you are saved, and as you get a hold of the truth, you become the seed in that family that is to be multiplied. So God's whole plan, in fact, let me take another shift here. Ephesians chapter 2, and again, we're going to come back and we're going to work on this passage. Because you see, oh man, hmm, the very sacrifice of Christ was for the purpose that once the sacrifice is done, it gives God the right for ages to come to manifest his infinite grace and, and, and favor and kindness for generations, for ages and for ages. For eons from now, God's going to still be demonstrating how good, how gracious, how kind, how loving he is. To the future generations and whoever else is going to be on with, with all the planets, he's going to be demonstrating it forever. And the reason he's going to be able to do it is because of the sacrifice of Christ. That's how far reaching this stuff is. That's how important this is to God. What Jesus did. Amen. And that is why we must awake to it. So, anyway, it goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 that you are God's workmanship. What does that mean, you, God's workmanship? It means that you are the very product that came out of Christ's sacrifice. You are exactly what God had envisioned, that God had designed, that God had spoken about before the foundation of the world. That is why you had none to do with it. It was before you were even conceived. God knew, God planned, God, God had figured, this is how I want you to be. This is the plan I've got for your life. You know, when we get to the point, which I don't believe we're going to get to today, or maybe we, when we get to the point of understanding what's our part in loving out our lives even unto death, when we come to the realization of that and make that our pursuit, because that's what it's going to finally come down to. That is the last part in that list of eight, by the way. <laughs> Amen. And I think it's the last part because everything else stands on top of it. The salvation, the strength, the, 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 the power of the Christ, the, the power of Christ, the kingdom. Of, all of it stands on what? It stands and the enemy being cast down and being kept in his place. All of it stands on the overcoming. Blood of the Lamb, word of the testimony. Love not their lives even unto death. You are crucified in Christ, but now when you awake to that, what does that mean? When you awake to the fact that I'm crucified in Christ and it is no longer I to live, yet I'm still here, but it's not really me, but it's Christ that lived in me. When you awake to that and you recognize, I want this to become my testimony. I want this to become the, my life. I want this to become the picture of who I am. One that is crucified, dead, ended, finished in Christ, and it's not me anymore. In fact, it is not me. It looks like me, but it's not really me. It's Christ that lived in me, and it is now his life being emanating through me. When I've decided that that's what I'm going to pursue, I also have to decide 
that I must pursue the end of me. Where, the Bible says, when you lose your life, that's when you're going to find it. You cannot have the life of Christ dominating you, reigning through you, and living in that life, and being totally anchored in that life, while you're still trying to be you. To me, I got to pursue the end of me. He already finished me, but now I got to finish me. Hello? But when, what does it look like? What does it look like when I recognize it's no longer I, I'm dead, I was buried in Christ. I'm a product of his sacrifice. And that begins with that his death and his burial finished me off. And here I am alive now in his resurrection. What does that look like? If just the first little part that I'm dead in him. What does dead men look like? You can, you can put a whack full of money on a dead man's chest and he's not tempted to take any of it. You can, you can parade whoever and whatever in front of him and his eyeballs won't even move. You can poke him. You can't make him ha happy. You can make him sad. In fact, you can irritate him. He has no ambition of his own. He got no dreams or any. He, I mean, he doesn't, oh, he doesn't come up with all these plans. He don't have any. He's dead. Do you understand that? And the plan of God and the will of God and the purposes of God, that's what takes him over. And God's will becomes his will. God's purpose for him to live and function in the life of Christ and duplicate and multiply that life, that possesses him. Are you with me? You see, in the world, you are alive. In you, the world, you got to look out for number one. In the world, what does my, what does my flesh and my mind say I got to have? And I need it now. I want it now. I got to have it now. And everybody get out of my way. That person is dead. So when we wake to love not our lives even unto death, oh, watch out, world. Hmm. It is the life of Christ that is going to start showing up. Anyway, so you are God's workmanship. You are a product of Christ's perfect sacrifice. You are God's reward, his inheritance. You are, and that person on the inside, the Bible says, is holy, blameless in the sight of God. Oh, hallelujah. God looks at you. You see, the world, man, the conflicts, the conflicts want to dictate to you and define you. The world wants to define you. Your past and issue wants to define you. God says, no, 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 no. All those things, all those issues of your humanity, when you were buried with Christ and you died with him, or when you died with him and were buried with him, those things were finished. They are not to rule and dominate you anymore. And it's no longer your identity. Christ is now your life. He says it's over, it's finished, it is done. And when you awake to that, and you recognize that's over, and who I am is the life of Christ. I am his child, and he sees me, Colossians 1, 21 and 22, because of the sacrifice of Christ. As I've been raised up with Jesus, he sees me. And I'm holy. I'm as holy as God is holy. Oh, on the inside, you are so holy, so pure, so perfect. Blameless. He sees no blame. Faultless. He looks at inside of your spirit and he sees there is nothing to correct. You are perfect. You are complete. That's how he sees you. Now, I'll tell you something. The conflicts and everybody else don't see you that way. Now, here's something. Here's this thought. If you do not see yourself the way God sees you, you're siding with the enemy. The moment you separate yourself and you don't see yourself, God sees me this way, yeah, but. As soon as you get the but in there, you're siding with the enemy. Do you see 
That's why the Bible says sin is what? Separation. The moment you separate yourself in, in your thinking, you are making God a liar. Now you see, religion comes and it takes the world psychology and they want to pat you. They want to pat you and they want you to, to now go over these things. And to, uh, uh, uh. No, it's all a lie. It's done. It's finished. It's over. Amen? Sorry if this sounds harsh, but it's the truth. And if you will take this truth, then you can chop off all of those lies out of your life and start thinking straight. Amen? There is a, you are, a new, you are his workmanship. Let me continue here. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 10 that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. But it says that you have been created and this was not based on your works. You are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Your works, your goodness, what you, what you did, what you didn't do, who you were, who your family was, none of nothing. I mean, you, there was no earning, no deserving, nothing on your part. This was the, all that it is. It is because of the sacrifice of Christ plus zero part on your part. No works and no works. All right. But now God says you're his workmanship and there are pathways that he wants you to walk in. There are pathways that he ordained before the foundation of the world that you should walk in. In other words, God says, here are some paths. This is how I want you to walk. This is where you are to live. This is where you are to function from. And this here was stuff that he had ordained before the foundation of the world. That means, again, you had nothing to do with it. That's why I don't even try to think it up. All right, what are these pathways? Remember, it's about the truth. The truth is the weapon. The truth and its application is what will cause the life of Christ to manifest. And when you share that with somebody else, then it can begin to multiply. Here is the pathway. There is a pathway that God has ordained before the foundation of the world for you to walk in, and it's truth. It is the truth of who you are in Christ to start with. And it is for you to multiply or to multiply or reproduce that truth in others. That's it. That's your life. That's your life. It's about the life of Christ and multiplying the life. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 10, let me just pick it up in, let's just pick it up in verse, verse, verse 1. I'm heading to verse 6, 7. I'll just, I'll just read straight through there. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer year by year, continually make the comers dear unto perfect. All the blood of the bulls and goats in the Old Testament could not make those that approach God perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers once purged should have no more consciousness of sins. In the eyes of God, to be perfect is to have no more consciousness of sins. Why should you have a consciousness of sins if you don't have any? Why should you have a consciousness of sins if the blood has removed and washed them away completely? Why should you have a consciousness of sin if the, if the blood of Jesus has wiped away the memory of it even in heaven? Where God says, I will remember them no more. Well, why are you remembering them? Why are, you, why are you receiving the reminders from others? If the accuser is cast down, why are you receiving any type of accusation from yourself or from anyone else? It means that you don't believe that. You don't believe the accuser is cast down. Remember, if you don't believe and embrace these eight things in Revelation chapter 12, you're going to find yourself in the war group instead of the rejoice group, all right? But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he coming into the world, he said, Jesus, before he came into the world, he knew. I mean, he was in heaven <laughs> before he got here. Amen? He said, I came from heaven. He knew. Leaving heaven, he knew that the father didn't like this blood and bulls and goats. 
He knew that that thing was not pleasing God. He knew that every time that blood and bulls and goats were shed, it was just reminding the father that there is something wrong and it's not working. He knew that. So he said, in verse, in, um, um, in verse um, 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. He knew that. Wherefore, when he coming into the world with that in his mind, he says, sacrifice and offering you would not. You, you took no pleasure in them. And then watch this. He says, but a body you have prepared for me. You did, all that animal stuff didn't work, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus says, God, the Father, has prepared a body which was provided through Mary's womb. And all the time, watch this, all the time, and that body itself, was going to be offered up as a sacrifice and the blood poured out. All the time, the 33 and a half years or the 30 years that Jesus was walking the shores of Galilee. As he was walking, he was carrying that. He had a sacrifice with him all the time. All the time. I remember one time when I was, when I was early when I was saved and, and I had this vision, so to speak. And I saw Jesus at 12 years old, they say, was it, or in those early years. And you remember how he used to go to the temple? And I saw this picture where Jesus was in the temple and he was watching. He was watching like an like a inquisitive kid. Very soft, very gentle, but he was watching. And he saw them slaughtering the bulls and the goats and the animals. And, and he saw the lamb and, uh, as, it was, uh, as his blood was shed and he saw the blood poured out and he, and he was watching it. And somehow... As he was watching it, somehow in the vision, I came to understand that he knew that was him. That's going to be him. He was going to be the Lamb of God. Because all his bulls and goats was not acceptable. But the body God had given him was a body that he was walking around with that one day he was going to offer as a sacrifice for sins. So I said... In burnt offerings and sacrifices of a sin, you didn't have no pleasure. So I said, I come. I have come. In the volume of the book is written of me. I have come to do your will. How have you come to do the will of the Father, Jesus? How? What do you mean you come to do his will? How? He says, by offering up this body. The very offering up of my body is the will of God. And above when he says, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are the offering by the law. Then said I, I'm here, Lord. I come to do your will, O God. He take away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will. What is the will? It is the offering up of his body. It was his, himself as the sacrifice. By this sacrifice, he's... Um, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Saints, let me say this to you. Many times believers, we struggle. What is the will of God? What is the will of God? The will of God is the sacrifice of Christ. So when the Bible says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what does it mean? It means may the sacrifice of Christ have the same impact on earth as it is in heaven. Will you allow the sacrifice of Christ to have the impact on your thinking and on your life as it has in heaven? What does the sacrifice of Christ, what is the record? What does the books in heaven have to say about your sin and sickness and about your past and about this and about... What does the sacrifice of Christ say? Well, whatever it says, you need to be a doer of it to have it here on this earth. And not walk according to the vanity of your mind and not walk according to... Like those whose minds have been clouded and blinded by the reasoning and the intellect of men and alienated from the very life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Are you with me? The will of God is the sacrifice of Christ. So when, it, when, 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 when um, in Colossians chapter, matter of fact, Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, when Paul was praying that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and in all spiritual understanding, what was Paul praying? Paul was praying that you, Marcia, that you, Jack, that you, Harry, that you, Johnny, that you, William, that you might know 
and be filled with the knowledge of the sacrifice of Christ and come to an understanding and a comprehension what it's about and its impact on your life and the world around you. That's what he was praying. The eyes of your understanding be open. That's what he's talking about. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. This guy named Epaphritius who prayed his way and who worked so hard he almost killed himself in the process according to Philippians. The Bible says, who, uh, Epaphrias, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Well, what was he praying? God bless Susie. What was he praying? What was he laboring and praying about day and night? Is it all those religious prayers that we hear in, 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 in some places? No, look what he was praying. He was praying that they might stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. What does that mean? He was praying that you might stand perfect and complete in the sacrifice of Christ. Amen. I got a, a word came out on, 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 on Friday prayer, prayer as we were praying. All right, someone, as we were praying, actually, Frida, <laughs> when we were praying, had a vision. And um, coming out of the vision that she had, then we start trying to figure, well, well what is this and what, what does it mean? And, 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 the, and the, the essence of it, the, if, I can, if I can just take a piece of it, right, was, was where she saw this hand and, and, and there were these seeds and the seeds, some of the seeds had fallen to the ground, but there were still seeds that remained. Right? And the whole thing of it, when I begin to, uh, 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 as I begin to, to, to think about it and we begin to pray about it, the Lord showed me this. The Lord showed me that what it was is this, that those seeds is the truth about the sacrifice of Christ. And he was saying to me personally that you began, you began to teach about the sacrifice of Christ. You began to put this truth out, but the truth fell to the, it fell to the ground. And you never went further. You never, the people never got a hold of how to apply it. And as a result, those seeds just fell to the ground. But at the same time, he was saying, don't worry about it. There's a seed left. There's enough seed left. And he was saying, go back to it. Pick it up again. And you begin to teach the sacrifice. But this time, don't stop until they get a hold of it. Until they get a hold of how to apply it. And when they begin to apply it, and then it begins to bring up the harvest in their lives, then teach them how to go and have this multiplied. So that it won't be you and me and you and me. It's going to be you, me, and us and all of them. Because they all are going to come in. It's all about this. So I'm not just doing this because I, 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 and there's some anger on the inside of me. It's not against you. It's not against people. But it's against the lies and the deception of the enemy that have kept Christians in bondage. Bondage to all kinds of garbage that Jesus has defeated them from. That's wrong. The fine has been paid. They are free to go, but yet they're in a cage. And they're in prison. That's nonsense. That's an, that's, that's an insult to the sacrifice of Christ. Why? Because religious-minded people have in a form of godliness, but they have no understanding about the power. The preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. But religious-minded people who don't, who don't understand that, Go and give people a whole bunch of other new set of laws and a whole bunch of rules. And in the meantime, departing away from the simplicity that is in Christ. You are your life ended so that you can have a new life, which is the life of Christ. And you need to awake to that and take it up and run with it. And God, the Holy Ghost, will manifest the life of Christ. He will manifest it when we acknowledge the truth. When we acknowledge who he is, who we are, and what a sacrifice have done, he will manifest the truth. And he will cause it to be multiplied. But he's waiting for a people. Because we have now become the body of Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, present your body a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Why? It's about the will of God. It is about the will of God, which is the sacrifice of Christ, and you're appropriating that sacrifice. 
Amen. It's not all this other stuff. That's what it's about. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, look, he says, when I come, right, let me read it correctly. Let me, I'm not going to misquote it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What is he talking about? Paul was saying, I'm here. And I'm not here to find out who's a doctor and who's a lawyer and how many kids you have. I'm not here to find out all of this. I'm not here to hear any of that stuff. I am here and all I am determined, all I want to know is about Jesus Christ. How have you appropriated him? Are you, have, you ident have you been crucified with him? And is he alive in you? He said, show me. Show me that he's alive in you. And until I can see him alive in you, I'm not impressed. That's what he's saying. And he says, the reason why I'm coming on so strong is because I don't want your wisdom to, I don't want your faith to be in the wisdom of men, but I want you to come up to the place where your faith and your confidence is in the power of God. The power of the sacrifice. Because this is what God is concerned about. Amen? God is not concerned about our religious games. He couldn't care less. Amen? It's not about that. It's all about Christ. It's all about his son. It's all about that sacrifice. And you are his reward from that sacrifice. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Say, Father in heaven, open up my eyes and let the sacrifice of Christ has the same impact in my life as it has in heaven. Let the sacrifice of Christ and the blood of Christ speak to me, speak in me, and speak through me as it speaks in heaven. I put away childish things. I put away the f formalities and, 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 and rudiments and, and, and all the religious stuff. I laid aside. I conquered all but dung. But I pressed for the mark that I might know Christ, him in me, me crucified with him and me alive in his resurrection. Father, I'm asking and I receive grace that I can recognize I am crucified. And the life I now live, it's not my own. It is the life of Christ that is in me to shine through me. Help me, Father, to be anchored in the sacrifice of Christ. Help me to be established, to be rooted, to be grounded, and to live out of that sacrifice. That my faith would function from that place where I am in Christ, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I receive in Jesus' name. Amen.